brothers and sisters, you know, um, it's my pleasure to be here again this morning, and I'm afraid, or not, that you're going to have to put up with me all the time that 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 section of the Fitzgerald clan is on vacation. Whoops, probably have to edit that. Is on vacation, so um, let's see if we can't make it profitable for ourselves. So we're talking about the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24 and 25. And so we'll go back there, and that's where we're going to be the whole time that I'm substituting. Because, frankly, if a person was going to treat the, the Olivet Discourse thoroughly, it would probably take six months. So I'm willing, if you are, to have that six months. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Let's start with prayer. Our Father in heaven, we want to come before you this morning because we crave your presence and your power in our lives. We love the relationship that we have with you through our faith in the Lord Jesus. And we also love to read and study about him and his words that are recorded for us in the Bible. And so we're grateful, Father, for this morning, for many things, but for being here and for your word and for the fellowship that you give to us for one another and all other blessings that we have every day. So we thank you for this morning. And we pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So uh, last, last time I was trying to give a little bit of introduction to the Olivet Discourse, a little bit of um, background. And I, we started with, as you recall, we started with the triumphal entry. We see that in Matthew 21. A lot could be said about that, too. And we are in the Passion Week, the week before Jesus would be crucified. And one of the things that we talked about is that how Jesus was, had been rejected. He came to his own, and his own received him not. Um, so rejected by the Jewish people as a whole, rejected surely by the religious leadership. And we saw some of that uh, previously. And Jesus had something to say about that. And we got to the point where we were reading in Matthew 23, where he castigates the religious leaders severely. And we got down to the point of looking at the last few verses in Matthew chapter 23. So if you wouldn't mind turning there, I want to just make a few comments about that passage. Matthew 23, starting with uh, verse 33 works. Um, so we read that last week, and so I'd like to this morning to just make a few comments about that passage. Um, this scenario that we see in verse 34, I send unto you prophets, wise men, scribes, some of you shall kill and crucify, some of them you shall scour scourge, and verse 35, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth. That's, that's, that's a ser serious indictment. But what I mean, what I want to mention is that throughout, we can see throughout Israel's history, time and time again, and that's a fascinating study, actually, by the way, all in its own, about the times that um, Jesus sent prophets, and yet they rejected them. Um, when, whoop, when Dave was reading, uh, studying, when we were studying... Um, in Second Chronicles with Dave, um, in chapter 36, just before the deportation of the Jews by Nebuchadnezzar, there was an interesting um, 
passage, um, you don't need to look at it in 2 Chronicles 36. And it said, just, you could just listen to as I quote it or read it. Moreover, all the chief of the priests and the people transgressed very much after all the abominations of the heathen and polluted the house of the Lord, which he had hallowed in Jerusalem. And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up persistently because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused the prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy. No remedy. That's uh, amazing. I think we're in a similar situation now uh, in Matthew 23. There's just no more remedy for these people. I mean, another interesting, fascinating study uh, that we could do is all of the people in the New Testament who did respond to Jesus Christ, who did follow him, and it's really an amazing thing to, to look at. Uh, I never really realized it before and did, until I did some reading about that. So they, they even committed murder. And so we see in verse 36 that judgment is pending. You can't stop it. All these things shall come upon this generation. It's hanging over their head. There appears to be no remedy. It's unavoidable. And then verse 37 is classic. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stones them which are sent unto thee. How often I would have gathered. Remember that we're gathered, thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings. And ye would not. That's free will. Ye would not. If you, would, if you wouldn't mind, whether you're on a, a physical Bible or on a device, if you would just turn back a couple of chapters to Matthew 22, I want to point something out. Because when Jesus came into Jerusalem, mounted on a donkey, one of the first things he did was he told a parable. Matthew chapter 23, uh, excuse me, chapter 22, verse 1 and Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. There was basically a great falling away going on among the Jewish people, particularly their leaders. And, uh, oh, yes, there was a verse I wanted to mention over in Luke. Remember this? This happened, this, this quote is from the time when John the Baptist was ministering. And it says, but the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves being not baptized by him, not baptized by John the Baptist. They rejected, at that stage, God's counsel for them against themselves or for themselves. So he goes on to say in verse 38, your house is left unto you desolate. Desolate is like a wilderness. It's like an empty, unbearably difficult wilderness. That's your house. Notice how he says your house, because back in John chapter 2, when Jesus cleansed the temple for the first time, he called it my father's house. But now it's your house. And also when he was 12 years old and he went to Jerusalem with his family, he said, I have to be about my father's business. It was, my, it was his house, the father's house. But now it doesn't seem to belong to the Father anymore. It belongs to these heretics, shall we say. And finally in verse 39, For I say unto you, Jesus is saying, You shall not see me henceforth till you shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. So there's not going to be any kingdom right now 
He's not going to have his public revelation of himself as the Messiah anymore. It's over. And now there's going to be a period of time between now and when he comes back again, or rather when his people say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. When they are ready for that. Well, it still hasn't happened and it's not going to happen, I believe, until towards the end of the, the tribulation period. I want to point out one more thing. Um, look at verse 34. Behold, I send unto you. Who's doing the sending there? It almost sounds like the Lord Jesus, the eternal Son of God, is doing the sending. Because he uses that personal pronoun, I send. And verse 37, how often I would, would I have gathered thy children together. That almost sounds like down through the history of Israel, it is the Lord Jesus who has wanted to be gathering them together. I, I find that an interesting point. But we're talking in the Olivet Discourse, the main theme is the return of Jesus Christ, the, the coming again of the Messiah. Duncan, could I just put two verses together? You may. Uh, verse 33 in uh, chapter 24. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? For I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth, till you shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Ask the question and then answers it. Yeah, how shall you escape? And... So there's going to be, the disciples don't quite grasp this yet. And you would think they would have, because a lot of the parables that Jesus ta uh, taught, especially the ones in Matthew chapter 13, the parables of the kingdom, they, you, you would have thought that they would have gotten the idea that there's going to be an interval, a long interval. And the same thing with the parable of the, the wedding feast that we see in chapter 22, but that we just looked at. There's going to be a long interval, but even after Jesus was crucified and resurrected and spent 40 days with them talking about the kingdom, they still didn't quite get it because they asked in Acts chapter 1, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom? to Israel, they were not fully cognizant of what the program was. But that's what Matthew 24 is about. What is going to happen in the immediate future and in the long-term future to Israel? Uh, I'm just going to do a, a quick, if you have, if you want to follow me along, uh, along with me, um, Matthew 24, verse 3. Notice the phrase at the end of that verse. Thy coming and of the end of the world. And then if you look at Matthew 24, verse 27, at the end of that verse. The coming of the Son of Man. Verse 30, towards the end of the verse. The Son of Man coming. Verse 37, the coming of the Son of Man. Verse 39, the coming of the Son of Man. Verse 42, at the end of the verse, your Lord doth come. Verse 44, the Son of Man cometh. And we can even go into Matthew chapter 25 and look at verse 6. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. It's anticipation of the coming of Messiah back to the earth. Verse 10 in Matthew 25, the bridegroom came. Verse 19, the Lord of those servants cometh. And verse 31 in Matthew 25, the Son of Man shall come. Okay, so the overriding theme here in the Olivet Discourse is the return of the Messiah to set up his kingdom. But he's going to explain to them in this discourse what's going to happen in the meantime. Some things are going to happen immediately. Some things are going to happen over a period of time. And some things are going to happen at the end, at the end of the age. You can be assured that the Lord's going to take charge. 
You know what? I, I personally, I love those passages uh, in um, Psalm 2, Revelation 19, where he takes control. No equivocation. He makes the nations obey him. And he rules with a rod of iron. Uh, you know, for many years as, as a believer, I thought, well, those, those phrases, those descriptions seem inconsistent with my understanding of who Jesus was. But it was my understanding of who Jesus was that was inconsistent, inadequate. Anyway, um, I, I can hardly wait for it when he vanquishes wickedness and establishes righteousness. That it's going to be absolutely glorious. So anyway, the, the return of the Messiah. And one thing I mentioned last week is that I do believe that the Olivet Discourse is all about the Jewish people and their future, the eschatology of the Jewish nation. I don't believe, and I mentioned it last week, I do not personally believe that you even find the church in the Olivet Discourse. I do not believe so. And so, um, and we'll explain, I'll, as we go along through the Olivet Discourse, I will explain myself a little more thoroughly in detail. I don't see the church anywhere. I don't see the rapture anywhere. I don't see anything except the Jewish nation, what pertains to them. Much of the Olivet Discourse is about the tribulation, Daniel's 70th week. And, and what did the angel Gabriel say? I got to do something better with this. What did the angel Gabriel say to Daniel? Let me see if I can locate it. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. The tribulation is about the Jewish people. Now, one of the things that has helped me a lot, as I have been reading about and studying the Olivet Discourse over a period of time, is that it's absolutely crucial. Oh, I have a wire. It's, a, it's absolutely crucial to understand it correctly. There is only one way to understand it correctly. The way that Jesus communicated it is the only way to understand it. Uh, unfortunately, you would not even believe, or maybe you would, how many different interpretations there are of the Olivet Discourse, what it means, different portions of it, what they mean. I mean, there are, I don't know, probably dozens of different ways of looking at the Olivet Discourse. I believe that, um, well, there's a discipline called hermeneutics, and what that means is the, the, the practice of interpreting the scriptures. What are principles that we can apply? One of the principles of hermeneutics that I really like is scripture interprets scripture. It's really important. And so, I mean, I can't remember very many of those principles because it's been a long time. But another principle that I like to employ when trying to understand the scriptures is which interpretation of a passage has the least amount of conflicts? Which understanding of a passage has the fewest unanswered questions? And then I try to apply those ways of thinking about a passage when I'm trying to figure out what it means. So. Yes, context is king, someone said once. Who is God talking to? The Olivet Discourse is about the Jewish nation, about the Jewish people, but it is for the church, too. It's not about the church, but it is for the church. We, as believers, can derive tremendous insight and encouragement by understanding what 
is in the future and what's going to happen. I mean, we do it all the time. Uh, but so I'm going to take a little tour with you. When I say that the Olivet Discourse has a Jewish flavor, it is full of what you could call Hebraisms, Hebrew ways of thinking and terminology. It is, until I did, until I looked at it more closely, I didn't realize that the Olivet Discourse is riddled with Jewish thought. And so I'd like to take a little tour. I like the fact that our pastor frequently quotes that passage in 2 Timothy chapter 2, study to show thyself approved. Apply, study, apply yourself. Be diligent. Make every effort. Study, focus to show yourself approved. Approved means approved after testing. Okay? It's almost like the, uh, the word of God is like uh, silver refined in a furnace seven times. Approved. We have to go through trials in life, but those trials will help us to be approved if we focus. Uh, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Needeth not to be ashamed. There's nothing in my life, nothing in our life that we have to be ashamed. We're not perfect. But there's nothing that we can say that someone can point to and say, oh, look, look at that big flaw in your life. And you're a Christian. So it's almost similar to the idea of being blameless. There's nothing that someone can accuse us of that is we are practicing a sin in our life. So anyway, the Jewish flavor of the Olivet Discourse Follow along with me, if you would, in chapter 24, verse 1, it mentions the temple twice. Well, Christians don't have anything to do with the temple, except the temple of the Holy Spirit. We don't have a physical temple. Uh, in verse 3, it uses the word, what shall be the sign, towards the end of the verse, what shall be the sign Jewish people some of these terminologies are, are very subtle, but what Jewish people look for a sign. They were sign mongers, so to speak. Um, it tells us in 1 Corinthians, um, First Corinthians, when Paul wrote his letter to the, first Corinthian, uh, to the Corinthians, his first letter, I think he was probably in Ephesus. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. That's worldly wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews a stumbling block, unto the Greeks foolishness. So a Jew, if, if we look back through the Gospels, we can see that at one point, at least, and, and I think it was... Uh, chapter 12, some of the Pharisees came up to Jesus and said, give us a sign. And that's, as I recall mentioning last week, he said, no, no sign is going to be given this generation except the sign of Jonah. Okay? So, they're looking for a sign. Verse 8, it uses the phrase, the beginning of sorrows. Or you could say, the beginning of travail. Uh, or you could interpret that the beginning of birth pains. This is a phrase, birth pains is a phrase that we find, believe it or not, numerous times in the Old Testament, okay, in different contexts. In fact, in Jeremiah chapter 30, where it's talking about the, the time of Jacob's trouble, in verse 7, just the verse before that, in verse 6, is talking about birth pains, and including that in the idea of the time of Jacob's trouble. There's going to be birth pains involved. Interesting. Verse 9, it says that the, they're going to be hated of all nations. Well, I don't think Christians are necessarily, in that way of thinking, I don't think Christians are necessarily hated of all nations. The world hates us. We know that. 
But the Jewish people are the ones who are hated of all nations, not necessarily Christians. Well, Christians wouldn't be identified as a nation. That's right. Now we go to verse 11. This is interesting. It, says, it uses the term false prophets. Well, prophets are something that we find in the Old Testament. False teachers are something we find in the New Testament. Now remember what uh, Peter wrote in his second letter? He said to his recipients, but there were false prophets also among the people, the Jewish people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. So there is a distinction. The term false prophets pretty much belongs to the Jewish people. Verse 13, endure unto the end. Circumstances in the tribulation as it regards salvation are not going to be the same as they are in the age of grace that we're living in now. Okay, it's going to be more like uh, what you see in James chapter 2, faith and works. You've got to endure to the end in order to be delivered, and we'll be looking at that more closely. The gospel of the kingdom in uh, verse 14, that's the same phrase that was used when John the Baptist began his ministry, when the Lord Jesus began his ministry, when Jesus in Matthew 10 sent out his disciples. The gospel of the kingdom is something that involves an, the coming earthly Davidic kingdom. And it's different from Paul's gospel. The holy place in verse uh, 15, that again is the temple having been rebuilt in Jerusalem, has nothing to do with the church. And verse 16, uh, those who are in Judea flee, flee to the mountains. Well, first of all, Christians are not in Judea, and we're never instructed in the word of God to flee anywhere. We're instructed to look. Our citizenship is in heaven from where we are looking or waiting for a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We are encouraged in the New Testament to look and to wait, not to flee anywhere, and especially mountains. Not every place that Christians are could you flee to any mountains, but certainly in Judea you can. Verse 17 is an interesting thing, housetop. Most homes in the Middle East were flat topped, okay? And so a lot of things were done up there, eating, sleeping, socializing, Put it, storing your crops up there. Remember Rahab? Not. Yes, Rahab. She, in Jericho, she stored her flax on the rooftop. So on and on. It's a Jewish cultural thing. The Sabbath in verse 20 indicates the law of Moses being practiced. Verse 21, where it talks about tribulation such as what was not from the beginning of the world to this time. That's almost a direct quotation lifted out of that Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, talking about that. And, the, and it's mentioned also in Joel. Now I'm going to make a jump out on a limb here. The elect, in verse 22, that word is also found in verse 24 and in verse 31. I believe in this context is talking about God's chosen people because the word elect is used many times, or chosen, is used numerous times throughout the Old Testament. I believe it's in context referring to the Jews, Jewish people. Verse 26, it talks about, Behold, he's in the desert. Well, not too many places where Christians live. Some, but not all, are desert areas. Verse 28, it refers to the eagles being gathered together, or your translation may say the vultures. Okay, this is another study which is fascinating. All the different places in the Old Testament and New Testament where it talks about birds being gathered together to feast on the carrion. Okay, uh, Ezekiel 38, Revelation 19, and there are numerous other places in the Old Testament where it's talking about birds coming to eat up the carcasses. Verse 29 refers to cosmic disturbances. That's not something really that Christians are being warned about or are being concerned about. In the book of Revelation, in chapter 6 and in chapter 8, 
It also talks about cosmic disturbances. But these listed here in um, verse 29, I believe, happen immediately after the end of the tribulation, before Jesus reveals himself. So we'll be looking at all of these things in a little bit more detail. In verse 30, it refers to the clouds of heaven. That's a direct quote out of the book of Daniel, chapter 7, where in the same verse, it talks about the coming of the Son of Man. So when it, one of Jesus' favorite names for himself was the Son of Man. If I understand correctly, in the Gospels, he used it of himself over 80 times. He liked that phrase. He liked that description of himself. So when it talks about the Son of Man, it, it's also referring, that concept started back in the book of Daniel. Okay, so Jesus employed that phrase, and that's something that is very Jewish. In verse 31, we read about the trumpet, we read about the four winds. These are also Old Testament themes. And when we get to that verse, I want to develop that a little bit, because throughout the Old Testament, it uses phrases like the four corners of the world, the ends of the earth, the four winds, those kinds of phrases. And it all has to do with the Jewish people. Fig tree, verse 32, obviously, that could be, it is symbolic of, of Israel, not Christians. We're not, we don't have anything to do with a fig tree. You know, the one that a couple of days before this discourse, Jesus cursed the fig tree, and then the next day it was withered. That's a whole other story, which is fascinating. Verse 37, the days of Noah, the Jewish people are familiar with the days of Noah. They know their Old Testament history, at least many. And then when we go to verse chapter 25 and we look at verses 1 through 13, we're looking at the ten virgins. And there's no place in the scriptures that describe a Jewish wedding ceremony, but we know from tradition what it was like. And this parable of the ten virgins conforms to what we understand the Jewish wedding to be like. Very nice. And finally, in chapter 25, verse 31, it talks about the throne of his glory. Well, that's King David's throne in the millennial kingdom on the earth. So I hope that just by running through the Olivet Discourse and pointing out these words and phrases, we can see that the Olivet Discourse is about the Jewish people and about their future. Because it is absolutely crucial, I believe, that we understand, especially prophetic scriptures, but all scriptures, understand prophetic scriptures accurately. And so that's what we'll be trying to do. Next week we're going to jump right on into chapter 24 with both feet. We're going to talk about the three questions that the disciples asked. We're going to talk about the tribulation I think the first and second half of the tribulation are clearly delineated in this passage. And then we're going to talk eventually about the return of Jesus Christ. Amazing passage of scripture, just packed with truth. So I think that's as much as we're going to try to accomplish today. Maybe we'll have a better idea of the Jewish flavor. Yes, ma'am. Well, the church hasn't even been, when he gave this discourse with his disciples, the church hadn't even existed yet. But they're talking about Jesus coming back. Yes. So we have to be gone. That's right. Before the tribulation, we will be gone. And so what is the point of even discussing the church unless you had, uh, subscribe to uh, a mid-trib or a pre-wrath or a post-trib position on the rapture, which I think those are easily refuted. Although some people hold on to those things tenaciously, and I just don't get it. But that's okay. Um, I don't like to get into arguments with those people. Yes, sir. We need to see, too, that how the church was established, it was after 
Jesus ascended. Right? Yes. It was in the first chapter of Acts. Who was preaching? Peter. Peter. Peter was God's representative to the church. Yes. And so the point being, this is all, the discourse is all about the Jewish people. I agree with that wholeheartedly because when the Olivet Discourse was communicated to his disciples, there was no church. How would they be able to relate to anything that would have been said about the ecclesia, the called out body of believers? They wouldn't even know what he was talking about. And then by the time we get to describe the tribulation, well, the church is gone. So it has no place here, really, in my opinion. So um, with God's help, we're going to come to a better understanding of this portion of the Word of God. One, this portion which I have, one have been one of my favorite passages of Scripture almost my entire life. And so I'm having the time of my life here. I hope it's been somewhat interesting. So next week we'll jump in. We'll delve into the Olivet Discourse. And I think you're going to find it interesting, frankly. Shall we close in prayer? Our Father in heaven, we want to thank you that you can open the eyes of our understanding to your word. And you can help us to comprehend what it is that you're trying to say to us. And so we thank you for this time this morning. And I hope that it's been beneficial for all of us and so we look to you for truth and for guidance and for enlightenment and we ask in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ Amen mm -hmm.